Hello, welcome to the Thursday, February 2nd, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Let me first start with a quick update on the TCP dump vulnerabilities that were announced yesterday. First of all, if you're running Linux, many Linux distributions do have an update available, so apply that. FreeBSD also has an update available. Now, there's nothing at tcpdump.org as of this time. I just checked before I started recording. Now, as far as workarounds go, the vulnerabilities all happen when packet data is being printed to the screen. So as long as you just write it to a file, you should be okay. At least that's sort of my read of the patches that were released to that. But I may have been missing something here. Secondly, well, of course, you don't want to be rude to limit the impact of the vulnerability. And to do this, you can either have this dump relinquish root privileges after it starts listening, or better, you don't even run it as as root. Instead, you just assign the PCAP capabilities uh, to uh, the user running TCP dump, and uh, that way you avoid all these pseudo issues that you have uh, with TCP dump. So get patching on this. A little bit odd. There isn't really a lot of talk about this vulnerability. Maybe this one could have used a logo. I see it as a little bit more severe than some of the other logo vulnerabilities we had in the past. Maybe it's also lucky that as a result, we don't really have an exploit floating around in the public yet. And we got a great diary again from Xavier. Xavier is writing about what he found on a compromised server that was used to hand out malware. Now he came across this server by analyzing a Word document, actually a very similar Word document as we talked about in a diary couple of days ago. And that server, uh, luckily for Xavier, not so good for the attacker, was configured to allow directory listings. So it was possible for Xavier to download additional files from that server, one of which included a list of all the visitors to the compromised page. That, of course, then allowed Xavier to log into if particular regions or ISPs or such were targeted uh, by uh, this exploit and also what other emails were being sent from this machine. So pretty nice write-up and, of course, always lucky if you come across a system like this. And if you're looking for something to share with friends and family that are not necessarily technical, the latest version of the Ouch newsletter is out from the Securing the Human team. This time, they're talking about Staying secure on the road. Probably should read it uh, because it talks about how you keep your computing device and such secure while traveling. Cross-site request forging is always one of those vulnerabilities that cause a lot of head scratching and wondering what can you do with it? How do you exactly exploit it? And my usual answer is, well, uh, don't underestimate the creativity of the attacker. The latest example here is a cross-site request forging attack against Redis, the database. Now, Redis doesn't use HTTP, but still, you can actually use cross-site request forging to send Redis commands. The reason for this is that, well, when you send an HTTP request to Redis, you're sending all of these headers and then you're sending a body. Well, if any one of these lines doesn't make sense for Redis, it just ignores it. So as long as in the body there is a line with a valid Redis command, it will actually be executed. Now, to demonstrate this attack, we now have not just a GitHub project with code that can be used to implement the attack, but also a website that demonstrates the attack. I would be highly careful about visiting that website, what's in my redis.com. The link in the show notes just goes to the GitHub project, not the actual exploit site. Probably the biggest sort of lesson from cross-site request forging that someone should learn who is not a web developer is that any browser inside an organization can be used as essentially a proxy for requests. With that, any system inside your network becomes just as vulnerable as a system being connected directly to the internet, and these databases are not an exception. So make sure internal systems are secured with usernames and passwords, and of course protected from cross-site request forging. But that last part is really something that your developers have to take care of. And as a user or sysadmin, you may not necessarily have much choice in that matter. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.